You know, as Pastor Renee said, it was a it was a busy week this week. They're getting ready for for uh, Canada. Uh, we're getting ready for summer camp. We had a wedding in the midst of it. There's another wedding coming in a month. Just so much going on, but God is so gracious to us. He provides what we need at the time that we need. And in the times when we think, Lord, how can I do this? God gives extra grace. And He gives, He gives, He, he takes us beyond what we can do. So we want to turn this morning. We're going to look at the Word of God. And I just want to talk with you. And I want to ask some questions this morning because I know you know the Word of God. I want you to think about the New Testament. Uh, for for just a minute I want you I just want to ask you a, a question what and when you think of the New Testament what are some of the most common or well-known verses of in in the, found in the New Testament the most common one the most well-known is what John there we go John 316 for God so loved the world I learned it as a child when I was five years old in English and also in Cantonese that's because we lived in Singapore at that time and the congregation was Cantonese speaking San Oisayan that's how it starts out uh, in Cantonese can you think of any other scriptures that are very 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 familiar uh, in the New Testament as well that's it Romans 323 okay and those of us that have have studied in evangelism but even if we haven't Romans 323 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that's where we're gonna start this morning and and you say we're gonna talk about sin we are but be encouraged this morning um, John 316 I think is the most is the most well-known verse probably in the Bible probably Romans 323 is the next most well-known and um, for, for some of us, and we say, oh, then there's Romans 6.23 if we talk about the Roman road, right? But the gift of uh, God is eternal life. And we keep on going. So Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're going to look at NIV and New Living Translation uh, this morning. So all have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. Look at the person sitting next to you. Mm-hmm, that's right. He or she has sinned, and, and you know that very well, don't you? Because this verse is true of everyone, in my life, there's a foundation verse. And there's a verse that I, I speak of and quote and recall so often when I talk with others. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for me, a foundation verse for, for my own life and for every Christian should be 1 John 1, 9. And what is 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, let's, shall, we read it to, shall we read it together? Just, uh, just to right there. I, she included 10 because I told her to, but let's just read it to right there. Let's read it together. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the companion verse to Romans 3.23. Do you know that? It really is. For all have sinned if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I love this. When I look at 1 John 1, 9 especially, he's faithful and we think, oh, praise the Lord. But in the same passage where he talks about, he writes about, um, where John writes about, about our sin, and that God is faithful, at the same time it says, and He's just. And that always brings me such encouragement because here is this just God. Just has to do with what is right, what is true, with justice. It does not have to do with what is grace, but it is one of the aspects of God. And it says He's faithful and He's just and He forgives. And so here's this God that's perfectly holy and perfectly just and perfectly upright, and yet He forgives our sins. And so we look at these, we look at the, this verse. I don't know of a Christian serious in his or her daily walk and, and I trust and Lord willing this morning each one of us we are serious about our daily walk, about our Christian walk um, with the Lord that at times we, that we don't struggle with sin, that we don't struggle with forgiveness that we don't struggle with 
restoration of peace in our hearts and in our minds. Do you ever struggle with that? And you've been a Christian. I struggle with that at times when I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even though I know 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And yet I, because I'm human, and you because you're human, we still struggle at times with this. Yes, I, I've sinned and yes, I've prayed, but I'm still struggling with, I don't feel forgiven. And time goes on and and what we have done, though we've confessed it, though we've, repent, we've repented, we've confessed and we've been forgiven, it still comes back to our minds, doesn't it? And it's not just a flashing memory, but it's something that touches our minds, that weighs on our minds, and that troubles our hearts, and that troubles our spirits. I, I don't know of a person, of a Christian, who doesn't say, that is my experience at times. When we look at the Bible, and that's what I want to talk about this morning, and want us to look at some scriptures this morning, the Lord as I was preparing, preparing this week, and I knew it was going to be a long week, and I knew the weekend was going to be even busier, right at the beginning of the week, the Lord, He doesn't always do this, but the Lord just sort of dropped in my mind the message and the title for the message this morning, and the title is, Who Keeps a Record of Sin? That's just that, Who Keeps a Record of Sin? So that's what we're looking at this morning. And when we think about this, and we think about our own lives, I often, I so often think of David in the Bible, David the shepherd boy, the giant slayer, the king, the poet, the man who is after God's own heart, and who is also a forgiven and restored adulterer and murderer, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write of his own struggle in Psalm 51 that we know so very well, don't we? And I'm so thankful when I go to that psalm, when I think of David and when I go to that psalm, I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write those words. And those words have given voice to sincere hearts for thousands of years. They've given voice to my heart in prayer, and I know they have for years as well. Let's look at it together from Psalm 51. The whole psalm, but we're going to look at just parts of it this morning. Um, 1 through 3, and I know it goes a little bit low. I'll try to move out of the way, but let's look at it. 1 through 3 and then 7 through 12. And listen to the words of David <clears throat> this morning as he struggled with what you and I struggle with. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And verse 3 is what strikes my heart. For I know my transgressions and what? And my sin is always before me. Does that mirror what goes on in your heart and your thoughts at times? It does, doesn't it? And my sin is always before me. And then from verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Because we can't cleanse ourselves, can't we? We cannot wash ourselves. We live in a world that tries its own ways to cleanse and to wash and to forget. I think that's one of the reasons that so many people turn to drink and keep on drinking. I really do, to try to forget to try to numb the pain of the past, or drugs, or other things, or a round of partying, 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 just so I don't have to think about my past, so I don't have to think about my record. And the world has a whole, whole bunch of ways. How can I forget my past? But none of them are successful. But David says to God, God, you can make me clean. God, you can wash me. And then in verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. To me that's interesting when you look at all the different ways. Cleanse, blot out, wash away. All of these different ways that David talks about um, removing the sin and the, the weight, the burden of sin and the thought of sin from his life. And then in verse 10, how many of you have prayed this before? Many times, yes. Create in me, 
Shall we read it together? I'll move out of the way so that you can see it as well. From verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Every one of us. What wonderful words. Those words came from David's heart, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And all of us can recall times of tears and repentance and prayer on our knees when we too have called out to God with these very words. My sin is always before me. And so I ask you this morning, who keeps a record of sin? And as we think about this, I want us to think about sin and the consequence and the price and the weight and the damage of sin for just a little bit. Who keeps a record of our sin? God hates sin. We know that, don't we? Did you know? You, you knew that, right? God cares about sin. You knew that, didn't you? We all know that. He cares about sin. He hates it. And because He's a holy God, He cannot look and He will not look on the ugliness of sin, for He's completely holy. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when you and I have unconfessed sin, you said, but I prayed about that. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But when you and I have unconfessed sin in our lives, does it mean we're going to hell? I don't believe the Bible teaches that. But what the Bible does say is that when you and I have unconfessed sin in our lives, when we have sin that we have tried to cover up or not think about or push away or just say, well, it doesn't really matter because they were wrong too or they hurt me first or they got angry first or they're worse than I am. When you and I deal with sin in our lives in any of those ways, then we need to know what the Bible, God's Word, says. And this is what he says in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. Verse 2, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. Now in this passage, he's talking about the relationship God and the people of Israel. But we see in that a picture for God and his children today who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And what we see from this, and we see it in the New Testament as well, is this. Unconfessed sin in your life damages your relationship with God. It takes away any confidence that you have that God loves me. And does God love you? Yes, He loves you. Your sin will not stop God's love for you. Understand that. God still loves you even when you have sinned and you haven't dealt with the sin because He loved you when you were really messed up. He loved you before you became His child. He loved you before you had confessed your sin, before your life was turned over to Him. But when as His children we have unconfessed sin in our lives and we don't deal with it in the way that God says to deal with it, our relationship with Him is damaged. Our relationship with Him is there's a cloud over our relationship with Him. Does He still love us? Absolutely. He still loves us. Does He still want to work in our lives? Absolutely. He still wants to work in our lives. But unconfessed sin damages the relationship. It's a little like, this is an imperfect example. Have you ever had a really good friend and you had a big argument with your friend or your wife or your husband? Big argument. And really, it was your fault. Maybe they had a little bit of fault, but it was more your fault than theirs. And you haven't dealt with it. And you haven't gone to them. And you haven't said, I am so sorry. Forgive me. Whatever. How do you feel when you're around that person? <laughs> honestly, how do you feel? Yes. That's right. We don't even have to put it in words. And if we're honest, what we would say is this. When that's going on in the relationship, you don't want to be with the person, do you? You don't really want to be around them because you feel so badly about it. And so what do you do? You avoid and you go in other directions. And the reason I want to talk about this and just talk very practically is because 
This is what happens in our lives when we have unconfessed sin. When you and I have unconfessed sin, do we want to spend time in God's presence? Oh, praise the Lord. Do we? No. What do we want to do? Shh. We want to run. We want to go in another direction. And that's the worst thing we can do. It's absolutely the worst thing we can do. And so God talks about sin very, very seriously. And because God hates sin, and because sin causes so much damage, the price for forgiveness is very high. What does it say in Hebrews 9.22? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. That's in Hebrews 9.22. And then we go a little bit further. Let's go on to Ephesians 1, 7, and 8. In Ephesians 1, 7, and 8, it says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. And He has... God is so generous, isn't He? What has He done? He has... He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. So he's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. I want you to think about that just a minute. Because when we come to God for forgiveness of sins, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I think it's always good to remember the cost of sin, the damage of sin, and the price of sin in our lives. Ch children of God, when we come to Him, we must never come easily and unthinkingly and say, Oh God, forgive me, I'm sorry, and go on our ways. I think it's good when we remember the price of sin and the cost of sin. When we do, it helps to keep us from sinning again in that area. Does it not? There have been times in my own life when I've asked God for forgiveness in a sin that perhaps, because all of us at times, there are sins that we have, there are sins of habit at times that we have in our lives, that we, that we have weaknesses in certain areas and we come back to those. And we struggle in those areas. And I know in my own life, when I come to an area where I'm tempted again, in an area where I've prayed before, God forgive me, and I repented and I was sincere in my repentance, and I knew God forgave me. But the enemy comes back again to our areas of weakness, doesn't he? Or is it just pastor? No, it's not just pastor. He comes back to the area where we have failed before. The devil will always do that, because you failed there before, let's try it again. And you know, sometimes, Christians, let's be, we're looking very frankly at this this morning. Sometimes, when we are tempted in that area, you know what goes on in our hearts and our thoughts? What we do is this. We get afraid, don't we? We think, oh no, look at that, I'm, I'm falling again. And honestly, I think there are many times in our lives, the devil comes back to that area. It is not something that's going on in you, but the enemy comes back to tempt you in that area because I tripped him before in that area. I caught her before in that area. Let me go back to that area again. And when the pull is there, and when the temptation is there, we can give in to fear. Oh no! But brothers and sisters, when that happens and when that, when that comes, you know what I've done in my own life at times? I have asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, remind me of this. Remind me of the price that was paid. Remind me of the damage in my own life. Remind me of what I felt when I sinned and fell short of your glory in this area in my life. And there have been times, so many times, as I have allowed the Holy Spirit to do that in my life, that He has strengthened me and I have realized when the temptation comes and when the enemy comes back knocking at whatever door that was in your life that you opened before to sin, that the Holy Spirit reminds me and He will remind you, don't do that again. Don't go there again. Remember what happened. Remember the cost. Remember the price. Remember the damage. And then I'm able to say, no, that door stays shut. Amen? Amen. 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 And David talks about that. But I want us to come back this morning again to the question, who keeps the record? Who keeps a record of sin? Who keeps a record of sin? 
The pastors? No. Satan keeps a record of sin. Who else keeps a record of sin? <laughs> we keep a record of sin, don't we? We keep records of sin. And that's where I want to start this morning as we look at who keeps a record of sin. Because the enemy certainly keeps a record of sin, but we keep a record of sin too. So let's start with ourselves and we'll end with God. And halfway through, we'll just dip through and talk about Satan briefly, but we'll keep on going. I don't like to talk a lot about the devil. I'd rather talk about God. But let's talk about ourselves first. So who keeps a record of sin? And that's the quick and easy answer to that question. Usually, we keep a record of our sins. And if we're really honest, husbands, wives, friends, we often keep a record of our loved one's sins too, don't we? And you get in a fight and you get in an argument and you know what happens? Last time you blah 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 blah. Husbands and wives, I'm not married but let me give you some good advice this morning that is suitable and useful and helpful in every situation with a close person and with a loved one. When you get in an argument and when you get in a disagreement, fight fair. Fight fair. And you know what that means? What that means is if you and your best friend or you and your spouse get into an argument or a disagreement, if there is something from the past, either in your friendship or in your marriage relationship, that has been repented of and asked forgiveness of and it was dealt with back then, don't bring it up again if you get into another fight, if you get into another argument. If it was dealt with sincerely, I, I truly, we laugh, but it's true, isn't it? Yeah. It's true. And I will tell you this, the reason I want to speak strongly, and this is true for those of us in friendships as well, because when you have a close friend, I'll tell you, you know who you will more likely have a disagreement with? A close friend, right? Because you're in their lives and they're in your life as well. And how much more true in the marriage relationship. So when there's something from your past that there was a wrong that was done. Was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. Was it repented of? Yes. Did you forgive? Yes. Did the person receive forgiveness? Then let it go and don't bring it up again. Now if you want to damage your relationship, marriage or friendship, you keep bringing it up. You keep bringing it up. But I want to tell you something. When you do that, do you know how you're acting? You're acting like Satan acts. Yes. Because Satan will come to you again and again, as we know, and he will drag things out that are under the blood of Jesus. Yes? yes. He'll drag them out and he'll say, remember this? <laughs> he'll pull this out. Remember what you were? That's what he does. And brothers and sisters, when we bring things up and bring things out that have been, uh, when we've asked forgiveness for and we've given and received forgiveness, let it stay forgiven. Let it stay forgotten. Keep on moving. Fight fair, if you want to think about it in that way. Deal with it fairly. And your relationships, marriage and friendship and otherwise, they will stay healthy and you'll be able to move on. I remember many, many years ago, Pastor Renee and I, uh, together we counseled a couple, a married couple, and there had been great sin in the relationship. There had been unfaithfulness in the, ra in the relationship. And it came out as we talked together with the couple. There were tears. There was, there was so much that was, that was going on. And the husband, in tears, said to the wife in front of us, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she was weeping. There, there was so much, there was so much that, that, that was going on. And that's a very deep, that's a very deep scar and that's a very deep pain. But he truly repented and he truly asked for forgiveness. And as time, and we thought that takes care of it. But you know what we found out in that particular situation? You would never know. You, you would, you, you would have, have no idea. It's not even someone who is part of Lighthouse because you know sometimes pastors, we deal with things that are outside of the church as well. What we found out was that this whole scenario of repentance and tears and accusations for the same things had taken place in another church 
with another pastor in another place with a different church with another pastor with another pastor and the relationship was being totally destroyed it was being destroyed the foundations were eroding because what was passed and had been repented of kept on being brought out and brothers and sisters seriously seriously when things are dealt with in your friendships and your relationships let them go let them go be like God because we've received God's forgiveness don't be like the devil don't be like the devil in these things so we keep on going because sometimes we do that to others but what about ourselves how do we handle this in ourselves and, I, and I'm speaking very frankly and honestly because you know what pastors are people too and you know I sometimes a word or a thought comes back to mind and for me very often it will be a word that I have spoken in anger or impatience to a loved one I don't I don't know about you but and sometimes it will come back and I'll think God I'm so sorry I said that and I've repented I've repented I was so sorry and, and I repented of it. But it would still come back. It would still come back. And we often, we do keep records, whether we want to or not. And honestly, we don't want to, do we? And yet so often, we keep a record of our wrongs and of our sins. Why is that so? Why is that the case? Because we want to remember how bad we were? No. I don't think any of us do. But I do think one of the reasons that we keep a record of our sins is just because of the way that we're made. Because of the way God made us as humans with minds that think and remember and hearts that feel. And because we're fallen humans, we keep a record. Let me ask you something. Honestly, as humans, how much easier is it to remember the bad things that people have done to you than it is to remember the good things. Yes or no? Is, is that true? It's so much easier, isn't it? So often the, or, and then, and the same thing is true for ourselves. It's so much easier to remember the sins than, but there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, because we are fallen human beings. And God has made us with a capacity and a capability of memory and a feeling. And we're so grateful for that, aren't we? We're so thankful for those two capacities, those two strengths. But when they're not used as God intends, then we get into trouble and then we keep a record of our sins. Do you know, I want us to look for just a minute and I want us to think about uh, our dear brother, Apostle Paul, our, our Apostle our brother in Christ, Paul, who's in heaven right now, um, and who we're going to meet one day. Sam, your grandfather has already met Paul. The, have, have you, do you ever think about things like that? I do. He's met the Apostle Paul in heaven. Wow. And of course he's been with Jesus. But I want us to think about Paul just a minute. I want you to think about Paul's past. Not the part of his past where he was a Pharisee and righteous by the law, and a Hebrew of Hebrews who kept every bit of the law, but his other past. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. What does Paul say about his own record? He says, what? For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That's Paul's record. And if you read other places, Paul talks about he, he's a murderer. That was Paul's record of his past. And if Paul had kept this record of his past, oh, what power it would have had over him. But I love the second part that goes with this, and we see it in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Because then he says, but what? But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. Now, put up the other verse again. I want you to look at the verb tense just a minute. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Here's my English teacher part again, okay? What does it say? Because I what? Persecuted the church of God. Is that present tense or past tense? Past, past tense. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, what? I am what I am. 
What tense is that, present or past? Present. present tense, and frankly, for those of us who are English teachers, it's not just present tense, it is a present continuous, which means I am this and I will be this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we need to get our tenses in line with God's truth. Were some of you adulterers? Perhaps you were. Were some of you Abusers, perhaps you were. Were some of you liars, thieves, drunkards, this, that, perhaps you were. But what can you say about your life today? Can you say this about your life? Let's say it together. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. And what does that mean? God pours His grace in our lives and His grace goes to work in our lives. Powerful grace. Nothing wimpy, but a grace that starts working in our lives, changing us, making us, transforming us, doing what it says. Every man in Christ, every woman in Christ, in Christ is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, what? Everything has become. The new has come. I love that. that. I think that's the new living, isn't it? Translation. The new has come. I think NIV and King Jim say, all things have become new. That's the reality. That's the truth. When we keep a record, when we think my record was this. Yes, your record was that. But you have a new record now. There's a new ledger. And you are what you are now because of the grace of God. Don't let the power of your past and the record of your sins rob you of the work of grace that God has going on in your lives now and the joy and the peace that He has for you presently. Because if the enemy is successful and if you cooperate with the enemy, and honestly, that's what it is, isn't it? We're cooperating with Him. When we keep a record, oh, this, 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 and this. Go back to what Paul said. If Paul had said this, 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 and this, he would never have gone and talked about God. He would never have been the evangelist and the apostle of the church that he was. You and I, this morning, some of us would not be sitting here if Paul had kept a record of his sins. We wouldn't be, because I, I venture to say that most of us here this morning are a fruit of Paul's evangelistic efforts in the world. I believe that. And we're going to find out when we get to heaven, aren't we? But I believe that. And if Paul and the enemy, if he can keep you from believing God and, and becoming a Christian, he's going to do that. But if he can't keep you from the, doing that, you know what he's going to try to do? Once you've become a Christian, he's going to do everything in his power and he doesn't fight fair. And so he drags those things out there under, under the blood and he will work to render you useless and ineffective and full of guilt and full of self-condemnation because of this and because of that. Don't cooperate with the devil. Don't cooperate with the devil. And you say, well, I'm trying not to, but like David says, what? My sin is ever before me. So what do we do? What do we do? I think there are some basic things we can do, and one of them is found in Romans 12, Two. This is, and we're reading from the NIV. One, this is one of the reasons you and I need our minds renewed. This is one of the reasons we need to be washed by the water of the Word, as it says. It makes us holy. But look at Romans 12, 2 from the NIV. Look at this, this first part, the first part of it. Don't, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Stop. What is the pattern of this world? The pattern of this world is not a pattern of forgiveness. The pattern of this world is you did this. You were like that. You were this and that and whatever. That is the pattern of thinking of this world towards themselves and towards others. And that is the way you and I used to be when we were in the world before we became part of God's world, when he, before He brought us into His family. That is the way that we thought. That is the way we looked at ourselves. That's the way we looked at others. But Paul says what? 
but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. What does this word mean? Renew. What does it, what does it mean? Okay. Split the word. Re means again. What does this mean? New. new. Okay. Again new. Made new again. It's not just, let's fix it up a little bit. But when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're brought into His family. At that point, brothers and sisters, you and I have two great... Three. Three great things at work in our lives. Number one... We are no longer of the world. God has put His Spirit in us and we have a new life. And that new life, as we cooperate with it, as we work with and as we grow in it, that new life helps to renew our minds. It helps to make us new. Now some of you say, yes, but I'm still struggling. Okay, let's keep on going. Don't stop there. We have other things as well that the Holy Spirit, that God, the Father, has given us that we might have renewed minds and that we might no longer be like the world but transformed in our minds. And then when our minds are transformed, this, this trouble that we have with my record of sin is dealt with step by step by step. And God has given us His Word. His Word. Brothers and sisters, let me say it and you've heard me talk about it so much. Get into the Word of God. If you are struggling with remembrance, a record of your own sins, if you're struggling in other areas in your life with, with weaknesses and with things like that, get into the Word of God. Saturate yourself with the Word of God. And then, what goes with the Word? The Holy Spirit who takes the Word of God and does what? Wow! Then He goes to work. And the Holy Spirit empowers the Word of God in us and He starts transforming us. He starts changing us. And then those words that you and I read, that we've read before, that we know, that are so dry, they leap off the pages of the Bible and they begin to transform our thinking. And when our thinking and when our minds are transformed, then the struggle that we have with that record of sin, it comes up again, it comes up again. I it may not be overnight, but I start having victory over that record of sin. And what starts happening? I start remembering, God, your word says this. God, your word says this. It's time to stop this morning. We've got much further to go, but I want us to close this morning with some declarations of the word of God. Can we do that? You all know the word. And I want us to encourage one another in the Lord as we come to a close this morning. What does God say in His Word about how He handles sin, confessed sin, in the lives of His children? Think about that for just a minute. You don't have to give the exact whatever. You can paraphrase if you want to. What does God say about in your life and my life when we've confessed sin? How does God deal with sin in the life of His children? Okay? Anybody. There should be a... We ha should have about 10 or 15 different things. Pastor Renee, you start us off. I remember your sins no more. Mm, that's, that's next week's sermon. I remember your sins no more. Okay, and, and as we say it, think about Shall we say it? I remember your sins no more. Somebody else. Therefore now there is no condemnation. Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Someone else, raise your hand and wave so we can. Okay, Panina. As far as the east is from the west, so far as the east is from the west. Amen. That's, that's uh, 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 somewhere in Psalms. That's somewhere in Psalms. Julie. She took mine. She took so yours. Another one. <laughs> another one. He throws our sins in a sea of forgetfulness. I, we're going to talk about that one next week. <laughs> Is there a sea of forgetfulness? Yes. They, we'll talk about it. It's in Micah. That's Micah 7.19. That's Micah 7.19. We're going to, that's next week as well. Someone else. You may not remember the exact verse or whatever, but just thinks, what does God say how He handles sin in our lives? Somebody else, come on. Josie. He does not keep a record of wrong. That's actually 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And that's repeated again and again and again. Anybody else? A simple one. He forgives us sins. He forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Someone else, come on. 
Oh, you see, I know why we're having a problem with record of sin. We don't know the Word of God well enough. We don't. I'm, I'll tell you what, next week when we get together, we're going to get a whole bunch of these verses together. We're going to be talking about how God, what, what does God do with sin in our lives? And we will be so encouraged and so lifted up. When I was a child, and it's 11.01, so it's definitely time to stop. When I was a child, that was what my mother would talk, that's how my mother would talk about sin. It, she said, God throws when I would pray and repent. Because I was a child, and I, I couldn't really understand justification and things like that. But what I could understand was the picture of God taking my sins and just throwing them into the ocean, never to be remembered. And the other one that Panina said about as far as the east is from the west. I couldn't even, from there to there, that far. That's how far away the sin. And I could understand that as a child. But brothers and sisters, God has freedom for us in Him. He does not want us to keep a record of sins because He doesn't. You going to do something that God doesn't do in your life? There's freedom in Him and release. May we walk and live and enjoy the freedom that we have and the forgiveness of sins in the life of every believer. Father, I pray this morning that you would bless your people. Lord, may your words grow strong in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, may we choose